Hello and welcome to this video on stellar magnitude. Humans have been measuring the brightness of stars for centuries, dating back to the Greeks around 160 to 130 BC. An astronomer named Hippotus, don't quote me on that, my Greek's not the best, using only his eyes, or you could say he was viewing the sky unaided, so he had no telescopes or anything like that, so just his eyes. He grouped the visible stars into six different groups, which we call magnitudes. And he grouped them based off their brightness. So any stars that were placed in the sixth magnitude were the faintest stars, and the brightest stars were put into the M1 magnitude. Therefore, brightness increases as we go from M6 towards M1. It wasn't until a lot later that each degree of this magnitude scale was found to be 2.512 times brighter than the previous fainter magnitude. So to depict this, what that means is that M6 would have a brightness of brightness 6, but this is the faintest. So the next brighter magnitude along will be 2.512 times brighter. So we can call it 2.512 times brightness of the magnitude 6 object. M4 again would be 2.512 times brighter than the M5, so we can write it as 2.512 squared B6 and so on and so forth. If we look at M1, we have 2.512 to the power 5. Now when you type this into your calculator, you'll see that this is actually around about 100. So from this, we can say that a star that is in the M1 magnitude is about 100 times brighter than a star that is in the M6 magnitudes. Another interesting thing that this actually tells us is something about the human eye as well. It reveals that the human eye responds to light logarithmically, as each degree follows a logarithmic scale, so it gets brighter logarithmically. This could mean that our eyes respond to light logarithmically. With the advancements of telescopes, the magnitude scale has been extended on either side. Our sun, for example, has a magnitude of minus 26.81. Some of the faintest objects in the sky have a magnitude of about 29. Now, the faintest objects are typically the ones that might be imaged by the Hubble telescope, for example. In 1854, Norman Pogson used this magnitude scale to determine a brightness ratio between any two objects of differing magnitudes. And I'm going to derive that quickly for you now. So the ratio of the brightnesses, well, we saw from before that each degree of magnitude is 2.512 times brighter than the previous one. So we could write it as 2.512 with the power being the difference between the powers of those magnitudes. Typically, you wouldn't see it written like this. You might see it written in a different format. I'm going to quickly do the derivation of that just so you can see where it comes from. The next step probably doesn't really make much sense, but again, it will come in handy later on. I'm going to add a factor of 5 into the power in the numerator and the denominator. So in a sense, you're basically timesing it by 1, so you're not changing the expression or its values. You're just expressing it in a different way. Now, I'm going to rewrite it with the 2.512 to the power of 5. As I told you previously, this is approximately 100. But again, I'm going to express this slightly differently. We know that 10 squared equals 100, so I'm going to just re-express the 100 as 10 squared. And I'm just going to simplify this a little bit more, and I'll write the full ratio here.
this is our fully derived ratio that will come in handy when you are contrasting the brightnesses of two different objects that have different magnitudes. Now you're familiar with the magnitude scale that we use to categorise objects in the sky based off their brightness, I must clarify that the objects are categorised based off of how bright they appear to us. Hence, we are measuring objects using their apparent magnitude. The object's actual magnitude might be different. To help visualise this, I have drawn an image that might help. In this image, we've got two stars that are of different distances from us on Earth. Imagine that these two stars have exactly the same intrinsic properties. So they have the same flux, same luminosity. Everything about them is the same, except for how far they are from us, from Earth. Well, if we look at this relation here, the flux is given by the luminosity divided by 4 pi times the radius squared or the distance squared. Even though both stars have the same intrinsic properties, their apparent magnitudes to us will be different. Star A, for example, will appear brighter to us. It will have a more negative number as its apparent magnitude, because remember the smaller numbers are brighter on this scale. Star B is further away, so it would appear fainter to us. Therefore, its apparent magnitude would appear bigger. It would be more positive because remember again the smaller numbers on this scale mean they're brighter. I'm going to restate that a lot because that's something that confuses and tricks people and a lot of people forget. So a negative apparent magnitude means that this object is brighter than something that isn't a negative number. We can use this knowledge and derive an equation that will help us along the line. So going back to my derivation We've got the brightness. Typically, when we talk about brightness, what we actually mean is flux. So the amount of energy radiated over a certain area. So that's what we will typically measure if we are measuring an object in the sky. So the first step I'm going to do is to just change the brightness for flux. So B2 will become F2 and B1, F1. In order to get rid of the power format, I'm going to rewrite it in a logarithmic format. Times the right hand side by 2.5, so we're left with just the magnitudes on the left hand side. Before we go further with this derivation, I need to introduce the definition of absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude is defined as the hypothetical apparent magnitude of an object at a standard distance of exactly 10 parsecs from the observer, assuming no astronomical extinction of starlight. So we use a capital M for absolute magnitude. And this is the object's apparent magnitude if we were at a distance of 10 parsecs. This is useful for astronomers because it gives us a, a standard distance that we can measure every single object against so we can determine which objects are brighter than others. Why it's 10 parsecs I'm not 100% sure but I do think that the reason they picked 10 parsecs was because further along in this derivation, with it being at 10 parsecs, it makes the maths a lot nicer and we end up with a nicer equation at the end. That's just my guess though, I'm not 100% sure if that's true. So if you do know why it is 10 parsecs, put it in the comments below, I'd like to know myself. Now I've introduced to you the concept of absolute magnitude, I want to include this concept into what I've just derived so far. In order to help visualise this, I'm going to go back to the image that I drew before. However, instead of it being star A and star B, it's going to be the same star, one at a distance of 10 parsecs from the observer, we are the observer, and one at an unknown distance. 
to find an expression of the fluxes, because we're going to need this to put back into our derivation, f2 over f1, well, we have this expression here. So for f2, this will be the star at 10 parsecs away. And f1 will be the star at a unknown or a certain distance away. We can cancel. Now remember here, these stars are exactly the same. They're just at a different distance away. f2 over f1 is equal to d over 10 parsecs all squared. We can use what we've just derived as well as the definition for absolute magnitude and apply it to where we ended off from the derivation. f2 from before was at 10 parsecs. That is the definition of absolute magnitude. So I'm going to substitute that in. So instead of m2, it will be capital M as it will be the absolute magnitude of this star or this object or whatever it is that you're observing. It doesn't have to be star. And I'm going to substitute in what we derived for f2 over f1. Carrying on using log laws, you can bring down the power to the front of the log. So it just becomes 5 log 10. Again, using the log laws, I'm going to split up the 10 parsecs from the bottom fraction there. Since 10 is on the bottom of the fraction, we need to minus. This makes our maths quite easy now because log 10, 10 is 1. So minus 5 times 1 just becomes minus 5. Now I'll write the final equation in a different colour. Conventionally, you usually might see minus 5 at the beginning. So I'm going to put it there. You might I've seen it frequently at the beginning, so I'm going to leave it there. But you might see it at the end. So d being the distance to the object from us, the observer. Now see, the distance has to be in parsecs. Little uh, side note though, when deriving this equation, we assumed that there was nothing in the path of the object that would possibly obstruct or absorb light. We assumed there was nothing to block the radiation coming from the object. In reality, there might be some gas or dust in the way that could absorb the light. It might even block it out completely. In that case, we wouldn't see the object. It could be um, a cloud in front of us blocks the light or it might absorb some of the light. Therefore, to make the equation accurate, we add an extinction constant to the end. And this here is our final equation. So here we are, these are the two equations that we've derived in this video. The first one is a brightness ratio between objects of different magnitudes. The second one can be used to find the absolute magnitude, the capital M, if you know its apparent magnitude and its distance. Of course, you'd also have to be aware of any sort of extinction that might occur. That's it for this video. I might do another video including a few examples on how to use these equations and the most common ways that these equations are used. So that's it for now. If you found this video helpful, please do like or leave a comment. It helps me out a lot. Share with your friends and I hope you have a splendid day. Thank you for watching.